Tēnei tūta he whaia ka mehi ki a koe, ke hōnu re tēnei moku, te kōrero ki a koe, e tāna ki tēnei kaupapa whakahirahira, tēnei kaupapa hōhonu taumaha hoki. So I'm really interested about the relationship that Governor Gray had with Pōtatau Te Whirowhiro. What was the nature of that relationship? Well, given that the reign was only around two years, I can't see that the relationship was able to build itself, but I do believe my own personal uh, thoughts is that, you know, that was the beginning of a, a premeditated plan. From way back then? Yes. Because when Pākehā made landfall onto this, onto this whenua, we were already here. But... Um, with the whole intention of finding somewhere to live and someone to, somewhere to claim under the auspices of God and the reign and the reign of Victoria is that they came here with a purpose. And so what was the relationship between Governor Gray and Porto to Puerto? I think it was uh, uh, the beginning of a recipe to create something bigger from it. And the intent was to create a land where it was colonial, it would become colonial ruled. I believe that. So with only two years, and he passed away, we see the impact with regards to Tafio, is that uh, the, the relationship continued on the basis of friends and on the basis of the tikanga that Pōtato Te Whirupuru left and uh, the uh, philosophy that he left was that he wanted both uh, treaty partners, well, prior to that, he wanted both iwi to live in harmony. And Tafio, you know, growing up with all the um, traits of, of youth and then into adulthood, what he did was he, he was inspired by the whole word, the biblical word, and we're talking about Iho or Matua Kore. I'm not saying that he was absolutely governed by the Bible, but there are a lot of corridor in there that reflects on the nature and the behavior of Tafio towards sustaining that relationship. But it became, um, as the years went by, the relationship started to thin out the whole picture of the, the nature of the relationship with Pōtato Te Whirupuru, it began to expose itself, I suppose. Exposing itself to the real nature of the beginnings of those, that relationship. Would you say that relationship between um, Kingi Tafiao and Governor Gray came to a head here at Ngārua Wahia when they discussed standing the kingitanga down? Can oh, you talk to I us about that? Think, uh, I, I think it's uh, prior to that. Prior to that, because the relationship between Gray, uh, Gray and, and Tafio, it was built on the philosophy of that harmony, the harmonic relationship. But however, it started to fragment because Tafio had made it very clear that there were certain boundaries that were not to be breached by Gray. So when we look at the historic impact of what happened in Taranaki and having Gray having to take the ownership of that and the repercussions was that he was deported, yeah. deported back to his homeland. And having, having his mana impacted upon like that, is that I believe that history tells us is that when he, he was deported and he spent five years, one would say, in the cells waiting to be able to return to New Zealand, to one is to, to regroup, to regroup and to reinstate his mana. Because Gray, we know through history, he was working towards taking land. It was obvious. Mm -hmm. It's this, this whole fallacy between Portato and, and Tafio. It was very clear what Gray wanted. He wanted the land. 
and he was prepared to take the land by any, any, um, any, any, albeit forcible nature. So going back to England, spending five years in the waiting cell, so to so to speak, then being um, um, what is it uh, posted posted to places like South South Africa. He had five years to sit there and plan to reinstate his mana. Gray came back to New Zealand, I believe, with a with an absolute clear agenda of what he was going to do. And he was going to reinstate his mana by forcing, by forcible action, by taking the land, albeit by conceding, which we're clear that when they had that we here at Topiti, that uh, the response was that King Itanga would not concede to Grace's threat because it was not for Waikato and those Komatu to say, yes, it would. And the response is clear that if you want King Itanga to concede and to go under the mana of the colonial powers, then you have to go back to the people who created the King Itanga. And we're going back to the, the situation of, of 1856 mm. at Bukawa. So, Gray, yes, he came back with premeditated thoughts and he was going to do it. Do you think he used uh, that situation where um, Kingi Tawhiao said he couldn't stand down the Kingi Tanga because it wasn't his to stand down? Was that what he used to wage war? Oh, yes, definitely. Mm. Because if we look at history and it tells us that there was, um, uh, Gray had said that he had, had uh, you know, already prepared in his thinking and sent a messenger to tell Tafi and to let ourselves know that, you know, they're going to wage war upon Waikato. And uh, the fact of the matter, on the 11th of July, we know that. Um, that particular messenger nev message never got, never got to Tafio. And yet the next morning, they crossed the Mangatawhiri Valley, the Mangatawhiri Stream on the 12th of July, and waged war for the purpose of taking land. You, you've spoken in the past about some of those significant names. You know, what Pokino and Kopui, let's start, let's start with Pokino <laughs> means. I'm interested in that. Um, so many of us just call it Pokino. Yes. Well, um, you know, we know that uh, when uh, Gray initiated the cutting through of the road through Bombay, it was for the purpose of accessing Mangatawhiri. Mm. We know that. We know that the pillar that was, that was put up to mark the boundary of Mangatawhiri by Tafio, its specific purpose, it was very clear that, you know, this is the boundary, across this boundary, then, you know, um, there would be repercussions, is that, and Gray forcibly, um, you know, built a road for that purpose, to cross that boundary. And when we look at uh, coming down and, and the night that they came through, Kote Pō Kino Tera. Pō Kino and the places uh, more commonly known as Pokeno. It was the time that those, the night that those, those uh, soldiers came through that area and began to impact upon Mangatawhiri. So Pōkino, that is the, the true meaning of the name of the place, not Pōkino. And when we look at, um, what was the other one you... A corporator, but I'll let me talk oh, yes. about Rangiriri before that. Um, yes. You know, so they crossed uh, the river there and made their way down. There were engagements at um, Meri Meri and other places, but Rangiriri was a big battle there. It was, and I uh, mean, say, if we just reflect on Pork, you know, and how those uh, hundreds of soldiers came through uh, that road that was deliberately cut to access Mangatawhiri is that they begin to set up camp and the threatening images in your mind, if you can visualize, fires burning and our people wondering what's going on, what's happening here, you know, and you've got fires burning all around Kohekwe. Mm -hmm. 
and all these uh, soldiers are all positioned, ready to go into battle, crossing that stream. They, you know, our people were overwhelmed. My people of Tamaroho, and um, you know, Komatra didn't know what was happening. The images of fires, uh, people, tents going up, is that it would have frightened, it would have put the fear of not only God into them, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, they weren't aware what was happening. And so when we look at that, we look at Pokino, and as we moved through the whole, whole uh, passage of how these soldiers uh, mobilized, how they were mobilized to take control of all that land, we look at the redoubt that was established at Mere Mere, uh, just be, and we look at the um, the marae that was established, the fake marae, when in fact the original tuturu marae was further back. And so we look at that as how our people begin to to try their best to prepare themselves for the worst to come yet. Is that as we continue to move along that the whole journey, and and. Um, and in the impact on Rangiriri. We look at that as, you know, um, when I look at uh, some of the Ngiri that talks uh, about Rangiri, ko te pakiaka, ko te riri. Sad, very sad that our people were able to, unfortunately, with men, women and children, they stood their ground, but they were literally slaughtered based on the belief that the truce, the Pākehā Tikanga, was not honoured by themselves, Pākehā themselves. Our people, they fought courageously, brave, brave, they were brave. They died for the reasons, and when when I talk about dying for the purpose, it's the same as the impact that we have on the King now. Mm -hmm. Is that from that particular era, and we fast forward 200 years, is that the same sense of dying for a purpose, you know, is that uh, I for one, is that uh, the body is beginning to break down, it's beginning to collapse. And yet the weight and the mind is still, still fixed on that commitment. And that's the same passion that those men, women, and the children who sacrifice for. Not, not a lot is, talk, um, is known about women and children in war, but you know, in what we see in, in visual images is of soldiers, Pākehā soldiers, just men, young men, strong and fit, with all the guns and the rest of it. But when you consider that they were attacking villages and people's homes, of course there were going to be whole families involved. Do you have any recollection or any kōrero tukuiho of some of those events with Fano? I think, I think that uh, he kōrero tukuiho, I stories handed down. But I, when I look at that whole scenario about these soldiers, and I'm going to go back into another Mamai's thinking is that when the Europeans, the new settlers, uh, made their home here in Aotearoa, is that the, the whole establishment of a uh, constabulary, uh, soldiers, Men were taken from anything. They were, they were made up of thieves, drunkens. They were made up of men who did not have any value for lives apart from their own. I mean, it's a, those numbers, the capacity and the capacity of those numbers itself tells me that when they came off those boats, they brought them from England, they were worse for wear. They're the worst kind of human beings you could ever think of because they only wanted one thing, was the land. And so they were recruited based on the whole philosophy of the mind, is that it doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about killing men, women, children. 
Your objective is to take the land by force. And for me, that's how I see the image of the 1700s, the, the whale boats bringing all these, all these people, you know, and introducing alcohol. The whole idea around um, obtaining land for nails, nails, axe, blankets, the whole scenario. But I do believe that they were fixated in the mind that it wasn't about who you killed, it was about the objective of your killing, the killing nature. That's the whole doctrine of discovery. Yes. You, you know, with, uh, you know, the Pope at the time giving permission to just take the land and exactly. if they weren't people of the Christian church, then they weren't to be treated as humans. Well, exactly, you know, the fact of the matter is that say, look up, pray to God while we take your land, is that our people believe that God was the saviour you know, because um, again, we go back to the harmonic statements that was made by Porto Tote Birbaro. Is that uh, living in harmony with your new neighbors, the settlers, our people were responsible for feeding them, for, be a, for providing land for them to live on. But that wasn't enough. It wasn't. Mm. And so when you look at the greed, that greed is emanated now. Even today, you know, with COVID-19 impacting upon our people, there's still the greed out there that there is the preferred ones who want to sustain their businesses by way of, um, you know, impacting on the taxpayer. Millions and millions and millions of dollars are going towards saving these businesses. But what about the lives of the people? And when we go back into that era of greed, is that I can only say this, is that... Um, no, I don't believe those soldiers, they were trained to kill for a purpose. And that purpose was land. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about Kopuera, your understanding mm. of that? Kopuera, that's sad. Comes with some pretty powerful images. Certainly does. Mm. Certainly does. I, um, over the last few years, I looked at that name, uh, Kopuera. And as I, I continue to take the kingi tanga around and do presentations on it, it began to unfold its reality of the name when you break it into symbol. Uh, you know, you look at the, the whole symbolism around that kopu era. For generations, our people have been saying, oh, kopu era, kopu era, that's the name of the lake. And I said to myself, no, 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 no. When you break it into syllables, ko, pu, era, those who were shot. The image begins to fall in front of you, those men, women, children. After flying the truce flag, they began to run because they were being shot at. Ko, pu, those who were shot and the image of these people running across the road, running across the land, and falling into the, into the roto, dying, injured, wounded. And when we look at that, and I looked at the whole idea around hora hora, kopu era, those who were shot, it makes sense is that why would they name a lake kopu era and the people that grew up around it, the generations just conceded to the fact, oh, that's the name of the lake, when in fact it wasn't. It was an action that happened during that time. And when we look at Kopuera and we look at the lake and Horahora, Horahora Tanga Nga the scattering of the Ko Iwi, the bones of those people that were shot during that period of time. We're going back to 1863, 2021, November. And those children, bones of children are still in those roto. Men, women are still there. Speaking to Pat Kingy, Pat and I have been talking about this many years ago. And because I said to Pat, and Pat is the Kaumatua, uh, Kaumatua Ngati Naho, he's the Kaumatua of Hora Hora Marai. 
He's the last one living. And anyway, cousin and I, we spoke about this. I said, you know what? Anei taku taku whakaharo. Ko te ingo raka kopu era. Whakapakangia. When you separate and the words and syllables clearly denote ko pu era, those who were shot. All I can see is children dying, falling, screaming out to their mother and father. All I can see is the woman being protected by the men so that their whakapapa would live on. Sad. And so, hora hora, Pat and I agreed. He told me that there's still the scattering of ko iwi around the river. When the water recedes, they saw at that particular time, few human bones alongside the, um, the, the, the lower level of the river. So, you know, when we look at that, that whole idea around around uh, um, Kopuera, and we look at Waikato Horopono. It has the same, same, um, the same concept. Those who died, who were shot, fell into the river, they died there. Warriors that fought battles, they died, and they're still in the river. The core iwi is still there. But, you know, um, when we come back to the colonial period, is that the whole impact on Rangidiri is that those names around that area, the whole fury, the whole spirit around that fighting to maintain the last bastion of land. It was the last we had as Waikato, and that was taken too. Our people were imprisoned, our people were killed. And years, generations later, the land is returned. But you can never forget what happened there. I just think that now Rangiriri is accessible as a learning tool, an educational tool, for people to understand why land had that value to us. It wasn't about money value. It was a taonga tukuiho that we were responsible for to, as guardians to look after. And that's why our people fought and died for the land. Can you tell me more about that story about Eriri, Eriri, like the securing of Whakapapa, so the men who died and told their whanau to Well, run? you know, in order to sustain the Whakapapa, there were those women, those children, and there's the lineage there. And it was important for the Whakapapa to be maintained. And so the, the men yelling out, Eriri, Eriri, you know, Kitere, Eriri, they were running all running towards where they thought they could find refuge. And yet, the cowardly action by those soldiers, authorised by the colonial powers, kill. Kill, take the land. And so, edere, edere. It brings to mind today, we just farewelled our, our relative, and in my karanga, in my maiaoha to him was edere roimata, kia taua ke koi, kia edere koe i rungi te karekare o tō awa. Ne, kia puta atu koe, ki te moana nui a kiwa, kia tau atu koe ki te kai ngā whakamutu ngā kore, mō tātou katoa. And so edere, edere, again that spiritual concept around that side of using those words, but when we come back to the physical side, edere, edere was to to the men would die so that their women folk and their children would survive. To tell their stories. Yes, to tell their stories mm. and to talk about the courage of the men that died protecting the land. My tupuna was there, Takarei Tero was there. There was many of those men that were there. We also reflect on Kawo Island, you know, how they were imprisoned. And for what purpose? Gray had already devised a scheme where he could use prisoners to develop the land so he could benefit from it. And we see now, you've got a building there that uh, reflects the whole nature of the man. It wasn't about the people, it was about him. 
And so he is. It, 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 it is quite sad. Brings tears to my eyes. And I think about who Kitarangi, who have just traveled. It is out to go. It is a Irungi Takare Ongo Otoa by Edene. Lafidina Kitangato. So we look at the estuaries that join into the river itself and unfold into the into the uh, uh, Temoana Nuiakiwa. And uh, yes, so there's one one instance of using that phrase edere, and the other was to protect the whakapapa. Can you tell me your understanding of the white flag event? You know, the white flag event is that it's captured in the artwork of Fred uh, Graham, this sculpture of international renowned sculpture of Tainui, of uh, Kahukura and um, Kuruki Hapu. And it denotes the whole idea around uh, the symbolic uh, truce, the white flag, is that that's a Pākehā tikanga that. And it was supposed to be our people, well, they thought they knew what it meant, when in fact, it, uh, for that purpose, it was used as a, as a weapon, as a tool. And so when we look at the white flag, and if that's what we're talking about, yeah. is that uh, the white flag itself denotes the whole integrity of what the purpose of this colonial power was truly about. Mm. If they had to use, if they had to use uh, the white flag as a camouflage for their real needs, they would. They were not short on using it as a tool to kill. And it's still obvious today. The paperwork that our people have to f complete, they don't understand the politics and all the the policies of paperwork. So our people sign on the bottom line. They sign away their lives. It's one way of destroying. It might be slow, but it's working. Because the health of our people is deteriorating, is that we're the highest in imprisonment, we're the highest in bad health and well, and I'm talking about myself as, a, as, a, um, as an example. But the white flag is that I see that as the paperwork now. Mm. It's the paperwork that's written on white paper. When in fact that it's delusional. It's absolutely delusional because we all believe, yes, if you don't sign this, you will not get that. Yeah. It's blackmail. It's absolute blackmail. And the thing is that if you challenge it, then they make it more difficult for you to access any support from this government un under Article 3. So that white flag was very symbolic of the treachery and the destruction of a people at Ranginiri. So uh, my, my whole interpretation of that white flag, today it represents the white paper that all your details are written on. You are just a number. And if you don't comply within the, the policies of that white paper, you literally, you become literally um, brain dead, body dead, physically dead. A rebel. Yes, very much so. Mm. And there are rebels that I take, uh, I, I bow to them in Māori them because they made changes. Uh, sadly, today there's a different, there's a different image around Rebel, rebellion. Mm. It's the likes of, and I acknowledge the likes of Sid Jackson, Hana Te Hem Mara, Timmy Maipi, Tai Timu Maipi. I acknowledge that. Yeah. I acknowledge their courage, their bravery, and their determination to make changes in the whole idea around colonial, um, colonial uh, blackmail. The redress of all the redress of our right as a people under the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi is that we look at that. And again, is that being respected? We still have to fight. We mm. still have to qualify, mm. qualify our right to, to support systems under Article 3. 
Inyut, you know, when you start pulling those out, they start closing down. The paperwork, the white flag, the paperwork gets heavier and heavier. They change the goalpost so that you don't understand it. By the time you understand it, the goalpost has been shifted. It's deliberate. I wonder what, given what we've just talked about at Rangiriri and Miri Miri and those places, the fact that there's now a prison sitting in that back in your backyard. The, what's the irony of the prison in your backyard to you? It's deliberate. It's deliberate. It's a statement of power. It's deliberate. Is that by building those those institutions on our land? Naming it, giving it a Māori name, it's clear what the intent is. The high rate of Māori, Māori in prison, it's, it's very clear that when I look back at people like Governor Gray, is that his, his waiter was still alive in the waters because it's clear, imprison the natives. You know, limit the support for natives. It doesn't matter whether they've signed on a paper. Irrespective of that, they have no value. We've got no value. Anybody who has value is either brought off by colonial process, paid a huge salary, these golden handshakes, they become, they become um, in my view, this is how I see it, is that the wage of war on Waikato, in particular, let's use that as an example, is that when we look at it, it's the, the stronghold of power and the, f the falling of the, the, the collapse of the kingita, as was stated in that Topiri Hui in 1863, is relevant to now. It's relevant because our people are becoming, have become subservient. 90% um, of our people are still yet to benefit from s some of the claims that's come through. You know, 10% are living a customary lifestyle. I don't like that. I did not support the Ropa to settlement so that 10% could enjoy life's customary lifestyle while 90% still homeless. Mm. The argument that, uh, that was uh, earlier stated around the 1990s part of the settlement was that um, the claims money could take care of our people. Why should it? Why should it? When Article 3 is there. So we look at that whole scenario around our well-being as people. But once again, you know, not of any Waikato descendants' um, fault. No. Waikato are left to actually ask themselves the question of whether Article 3 should look after people or whether the claim should, you know, so the problem's been left with the people of Waikato again. I know one thing that when Te Kotahi, Sir Robert Mahuta, he was very clear on the fact, is that um, Article 3 is the responsibility of uh, the well-being of uh, our people, under Article 3 is the responsibility of the government. Mm. I totally agree. But while we're waiting for handouts, we've got also the claim, is that the claim has to be utilised to be able to create, create those support systems to, to better ourselves. Um, agreeing to the settlement was for the purpose of establishing an economic base. That was the purpose. And yet we still find that, you know, while we're establishing these little um, portholes, portholes of... Um, of uh, businesses and uh, development is that we're still still declining. Our people are still declining. On a more of a social aspect, what would you say was the impact on the war on Waikato? I like that, the war on Waikato, not the Waikato land wars, the war on Waikato. And I think first, we need to maintain that statement, the war on Waikato. Too long, the Waikato land wars has been used to describe what happened in 83. We didn't initiate that, that war, so I like that 
me. I like that war on Waikato. And I think that should be the label for this kaupapa. I really do. To take it away from the ownership of, of uh, constantly using Waikato land wars that will stay there forever and ever in the generations. So when we look at the, um, the whole idea about the war on Waikato, it was very clear what the intent was. It was very clear what the outcome was. It was very clear that we suffered. We suffered. We were dispossessed of land. We lived in poverty, and yet we were once the richest and uh, the wealthiest tribe. And yet within the, the wave of a wand, five years after this man returned, he destroyed everything we had, everything. He took away everything. And the disease that they brought, that was the gift to Māori. It made its way from the north down to Waikato. We lost our people, not only through the, through the forcible taking of land, but we also lost our people through the disease that they brought, the Spanish flu, you name it. Today it's the COVID. And so when we look at that, how, how have we survived? We've survived on the philosophy of what the, the, this house, this land means what the statement means. We have survived because of the faith and the belief. We had nothing else, nothing. Is that those Kaumamatu came through that period of time, then with the resurgence and with Tepua coming back to take responsibility of looking after her people on the, on the, the uh, I would say, uh, was it a request by Mahuta? Uh, I don't think it was a request. He literally begged her to come home. And she did. Finally, sense made the common sense prevailed. She came back. And we began again to restore ourselves, the dignity of our people, the whole um, quality of life. We had to start from nothing. Start from nothing. My tūpuna, Ngāti Tamo, at Mangatāwhiri, they died. They died, not only killed, but they, were, they died from this impact of something they could not see, but yet feel. Mm. So, um, if, if um, that is a picture of uh, what we were deprived of, um, deprive is a good word. And yet, uh, to think of another word to describe it, it would be murderous. The murderous intent to take land, to destroy people, and to destroy, to destroy us as Māori. Start with the head. Break the kingitanga. Break the back of the kingitanga. Try to destroy the kingitanga, you destroy everything else. But no, it became stronger and stronger. Sadly, um, Yes, through the loss of 1.2 million acres of land is that uh, we've been able to establish an economic base to once again um, to, to, to build not only our wairua, not only ourselves as a people, but to build something tangible that can move into the new world without losing the whole chicken around the past. If we forget the past, me, is that uh, what purpose is it of you and I talking about this today? So the past needs to be, needs to be there, there in your face. It needs to be able to, 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 um, to make people understand. Pake out there, ethnic groups who don't understand, but they have felt the pain is that in particular the other signatory to the Treaty of Waitangi. You need to understand the impact that you created upon us as people. The whole idea for me is that I'm lucky me. I'm the last of here at Tūranga Wawai. My family came here in 1921. That's 99 years ago. 
I'm the last, last left. Uh, there are other aunties out on the streets. They've chosen to live in uh, neighbourhood streets. But when you left to hold the, the wairua and the modi of the hokain, it's another thing. Mm. And as the um, repository of information of historic, mm. cultural and traditional information, it's quite daunting to think today that if I died, all this information be gone. That's we're, we're so grateful that you're sharing some of it with us today. And it was interesting because you said to me at the beginning, Reo Māori or Reo Pākehā mihi. <laughs> and you said, let's do it in Reo Pākehā so that everyone can yes. hear the story. Yes. So what is it that you want Pākehā New Zealand? Pākehā New Zealanders from Waikato or from Ngāru or Wahia, we have it to learn from this. I think the world needs to accept the fact that the impact on ourselves as Māori was unbelievable. But the difference between Māori and any other ethnic group, and this is what I believe, and this is the way my granduncle described it, to Mōkai Kātipa, who became the husband of Te Pua, Herani. Mm. And in the old days, we used to have buildings around this area in here that we're sitting in, and one of them was called Ākara. And Ākara was the last building made of Ponga. And um, it was... It was symbolic name, and it represented a pākehā. He was the manager of the farmer's trading company over town. Te Pua used to buy all the clothing and everything from the farmer's trading company and also from uh, George Courts in Karangahapi Road, Karangahape Road mm. in Auckland. And uh, so when we look at that, Tumokai sat with us one day. We were sitting having a cup, cuppa, relaxing in between meals uh, during the coronation. And he started to tell us, and he described the, the trees. And as he came along, he worked along the islands, then he got here to, to Aotearoa, he said, starting with Hawaii, you've got the beautiful trade winds and the palms just beautifully, gracefully, sway to the winds. And as you move closer to, to Tahiti, you've got the different uh, images of the wind playing with those trees again. And yes, you come along to Hamoa, and then there's a different sound again, sound in the, 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 the movement of the trees, of the branches. And the sound is like the laka laka. Then you've gone closer to Rarotoa, and it becomes different again. The trees are much more closer. And uh, uh, we look at Enuamania, the fra fragrance of those islands captured in the images. Then as we get here to Aotearoa, you've got the chiefly trees, that of the Kodi, of the Rimu, standing very strong and tall and uh, infallible. They won't bend to nothing. And he described that as us as Māori being exactly that. Uh, he likened us to the trees of the Tōtara, the Kodi. And again, those trees are used to, to manifest all things in carving, to tell the story, to visually tell the story of who, what, where. When we look at here, Te Whanaketanga o Taimui, is that again the stories are told, they unfold within this particular mural here. Is that he described that, and my my um, my message to all of you out there, to the whole world, and in New Zealand here in Aotearoa here, is that I believe that if we want to create a country that can live with live beside each other, that Māori and Pāke can have the same understanding as you would appreciate what happened to me and my people. Mm. What happened, how we became destroyed, you took away everything, but you couldn't take away the faith. You can't take away the weight of the spirit of why I'm so strong in what I'm saying now. The reality is simply this, 
is that in school we were stopped from speaking Māori. Every word we said was a bastard word. And yet you did not appreciate the fact that we could have imbued the school and its learning and enrich it with the culture that we have. And yet today, there is the movement on for you to understand, for Pākehā to understand and appreciate the sacrifices that we made because your tūpuna, your ancestors killed mine. And that spirit still, still hovers over me. It's still a shadow there. But I have to move on and so do you. The classic example is that there are Pākehā in this country that want the same as I do. For my children, for their children, I now have a mixed Pākehā genealogy, which is Japanese, which is Pākehā, and I'm very proud, I'm very proud of that. And I want a safe country for my Mokobuna. I want somewhere safe where they can grow up and not be subjected to, to all this again. It is my responsibility as their great-grandmother to try to make a change. And so for me, me, for me is that my message out there, help us. Let's work together and make these changes. The racism, Black Lives Matter, yes, true, that's sad, that was sad. Sad to see all that. But yes, I support also that lives do matter. It matters. But coming back to us, I think that the, um, I don't think, I'll say this, that what was taken from us is that uh, the restoration of uh, moving forward in 1995 is that Te Ariki Nui opened the door to everyone to all iwi to be able to make their claims, to benefit from what their tūpuna sacrificed their lives for. So a pāke out there can accept the fact that, take ownership, take ownership of what your tūpuna did. And don't tell me that, you know, that's old hash, that's old stories. Let's move on. Forget about that. I'll never forget about it. And I don't think you should either. Take responsibility. And by taking responsibility, then we can move forward. And so for me, um, I just want to make sure that when I die, I know the world is going to be safe for my great-grandchildren. Because this melting pot of myth, uh, mixed ethnicity is that it's never going to stop. By the time we finish, you'll all be tanned, you'll all be coffee-coloured, whether you like it or not. There will be the extreme, the supremacists, who will determine or will demand to ensure that their little groups remain alive. I think the stronger we become, we'll soon eradicate that kind of behaviour. I'd like to think so anyway, me. I just want to ask you one last question because you Sorry. talked about you actually talked about um, moving on and so if we come back to the to the war on yes. the white couple yes y you've lived every day with the memory of that through your name yes when you reflect on that how difficult has that been or or how amazing has that been <laughs> has that been an honor what has it been like to be called Mumai? Well, you know, when I was a child, when I was a child, I went to school and then the name became bastardized, my, my, me, me, my, my, and my, my, all those things. And I hated the name. I hated the name because my birth name was Terang, my birth name is Terangi Aroha. So you've got the extreme of two different scenarios in a name. And uh, they bring about two different spirit. And so as I grew older, and uh, I thought, I don't want this name. I don't want it. I want my birth name. Anyway, what came to pass was that um, I think in the last 30 years, I finally accepted the name. The name that was given to me, I was born and my great-grandmother died. And so I was the last child. Oh, last child. I was the only child. 
Mamai died. Mamai Terangiaroha died, and uh, they wanted to maintain the name. The name has become my strength. It's become my strength, and I say this, and uh, <laughs> I've got to share a story with you, because my auntie, Chi Rawiri, uh, my uncle had passed away, uh, Wittere Dixon. <laughs> anyway, we were sitting in Waikato, in Pare Waikato, and he was lying there, and I said to her, you know what, auntie? I said, yeah. Because uh, auntie Iti, she was uh, formidable. She was the face of Te in the last years. And uh, mm. she's my auntie. She married my uncle, my grandmother's nephew, anyway. Uh, uh. I said, you know what, auntie? What? I said, you know, when I die, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be formidable. I'm gonna be stronger, and I'm going to be, um, you know, my name is gonna be there forever. She said, how come? And I said, well, you listen to the me. I'm mamai keirunga yakoi. Every time they use the word mamai, that's me. People will remember me. And she said, hey, ki. I said, yes. And I said becoming that formidable person. And uh, over the years, uh, people kind of see me as, uh, <sighs> the young people see me as uh, frightening and uh, scared. And I was just reminded the other day, oh, they're scared of you. I said, what are they scared of? What are they scared of? Young people today who are 40, 50, what are you scared of? You frightened of the truth? And I said, you know me, I call a spade a spade, and I won't muck around. If I see the wrong, I'll tell you. I said, the purpose is to teach you so that you never make the same mistake again. That's how I learned. And I was embarrassed in a, in a whare full of people by my own grandmother. And man, I never made that mistake again. And so I learned hard in my whole idea around teaching these people is that trust in me, believe in me. I've been here for a long time, I intend to stick around longer. I said, you don't have anybody out. And so when we look at the name, the name was hard, or hard to carry, but in my older life, I've accepted it, and I'm proud of the name now. I'm proud of the fact that it becomes my true and my strength. It's the weight of that mamai, that hurt, that keeps me focused. I look at the, what I've had to do during my services to the kingitanga, is that having to work from, and I've, I've done it, work from the toilets up, from the ground up, washing dishes, all those things, and be, being promoted to the royal gopher. I, um, it's a balance of where you start from the bottom, you work up. Today I look at the, the rangatahi, they want the top, they want to go straight to the top. Sad. Sad. I saw in Facebook a text, it was a post that said to those scholars out there who've got PhD, now's the time to come back and take a personal journey with the tea towel. And what does that mean? I said that on Facebook as I've been having shows on Facebook on Sundays is that commit one day of your life to your marae, one day for the rest of your life, one day. Then you can enjoy the privileges that your marae has to offer for you. Don't come back and just pick up the tea towel for one day and stay away till 12 months later and you come back again. One day of your life, every day, every week, sorry, just commit one day and you'll find that the doors of your marae will open up to you. So the mamai, the name, it's synonymous with everything that people do. It's always heard, it's always spoken about, it's always there, it's, it's in your face, I'm in your face. And um, 
You know, when they say, oh, Auntie Mama, I, now they're beginning to appreciate these older teenagers that are 40, 45, they're beginning to see the value of what Auntie Mama has to offer. And uh, moving beyond the, the whole idea around this, we're scared of it. It's of, your, it's of your own making. When you don't understand people, you don't take the time to sit down and get to know people and get to understand the value that they bring you. Is that that whole idea around Rangatahi um, going into the new millennium with your kite? It's all empty. What's the point? You have, you know, we were gifted the three kits of knowledge. And yet, when you go into the next phase of the generations that's coming after you, what have you got to give them? Nothing. So, yes. Auntie Mama, I, I am. I'm happy with the name. I'm happy with the, the whole image around it. I'm happy that I'm going to live forever, even when I die. And so that story with Auntie Iti, I said, you know, Auntie, when I die, everybody's going to come here. They're going to be chock a block in this party. She said, why do you say that? I said, because they want to make sure I'm dead. <laughs> and. And I said, even right to the to wherever I'm going to go, Topedi, I want to make sure. Uh, it's just a figure of speech. Mm. And uh, I like to know that I'm going to leave a legacy that is valuable, that the knowledge I have, it's not mine. I can't take that to the grave. Tarikinui said years ago, she said, koe haria o taonga ki te rua. And in what came to pass was simply the fact of the matter is that I believe in that. I believe in what te pue. I, she is my model. And I try, I not copycat, but I try to undertake and fulfill what she could never have done. Mm. No, sorry, what she didn't do. Mm. What she didn't do in her lifetime. There was so much that she wanted to do so much. So yes, so mama, mm. I'm happy with the name. Kia ora, so yeah. are we. Tēnā koutou, <laughs> <laughs> no matau te whiwhi, o zrawe, it's all right. Thank you.